in our spring, our spring teaching, the incomparable prophet Isaiah, Yeshia Hanobi in, uh, in the Hebrew. And it's wonderful to be gathered around the Word of God with you tonight here locally in Tyler, Texas, and with our web students around the world. Uh, throughout the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, to the ends of the earth, the sound is going forth of his word, and we appreciate your studying the word with us. A little housekeeping uh, before we get into Isaiah. <clears throat> um, if you have not uh, speaking to our local class here, if you have not signed up on the uh, yellow pad uh, on the book table, please do so uh, and give us your e email address. If you do not have an email address, give us your phone number and that way we can keep in touch with you. Um, and uh, also there is a sign up sheet for our local group <coughs> for refreshments. And if you just, uh, what we have is the outline of the class. If you just sign it up next to that class, uh, then uh, that way we'll know who's uh, bringing the refreshments for that particular time. By the way, how is our sound doing? Can you hear me in the back? All right. Everything uh, okay? How about you, Roby? Can you hear all right? All right. All right. He's our bellowing on that one. Um, I uh, received an email today, uh, which made me glad I found out that this is the safest place in the world to be, right here in our Bible study. I'll read you uh, this little, uh, let's see, uh, well, uh, five or six, seven step uh <clears throat> reason as to why this is the safest place in the world. How to stay safe in the world today. Number one, avoid riding in automobiles because they are responsible for 20% of all fatal accidents. Number two, do not stay home because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. Three, avoid walking on streets or sidewalks because 14% of all accidents occur to pedestrians. Four, avoid traveling by air, rail, or water because 16% of all accidents involve these forms of transportation. Five, of the remaining 33%, 30%, 32% of all deaths occur in hospitals. Above all else, avoid hospitals. You will be pleased to learn that only 1% of all deaths occur in worship services in church. And these are usually related to previous physical disorders. Therefore, logic tells us that the safest place for you to be at any given point in time is at church. Bible study is safe too. The percentage of deaths during Bible study is even less. <laughs> for safety's sake, attend church and read your Bible. All right, so the school of Tyrannus is the safest place in the world anybody could be. And uh, we're glad you're with us, whether here in person or as web students. Now tonight, <clears throat> we are beginning the study of the prophecy of Isaiah. The longest book in the Old Testament, the longest book in the Bible, 66 chapters, except for the Psalms. Except for the Psalms. And uh, 66 chapters. It's uh, somewhat similar to the Bible. 
in that the Bible has 66 books. And uh, there are how many books in the Old Testament? How many? Uh, well, how many in the Old Testament? 37, 39. 39 in the Old Testament. How many in the New Testament? 27. Well, it's very interesting that the book of Isaiah divides exactly the same way. There are 39 chapters in the first part of Isaiah that speak of uh, uh, kind of a mixed bag of judgment and blessing and promises. And then the last 27 chapters speak of blessing and hope and redemption. So, um, in, in one sense, the book of Isaiah is sort of a miniature Bible. Now, what we're using for our text is the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And uh, the Old Testament volume, and the section, of course, dealing with Isaiah, the commentary on Isaiah. I have not found a better overall commentary discussion of the book of Isaiah than this commentary, and it is um, from a very sound theological position. It is conservative, it is uh, literal in its hermeneutics and interpretation, it is premillennial, it is dispensational, it is pre-trib rapture, it is messianic, it has uh, everything a believer would want to look for in a commentary and interpretation of Isaiah. So uh, if you want to delve further in this, uh, you can go out and get a copy of this volume of Old Testament commentary. It's, this is uh, uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary by Walford and Zook. There's the Old Testament volume and the New Testament volume. And um, they are available in your Christian bookstores and if you like to go into this more deeply, and it's not a bad investment at all because this is as good a commentary on the whole Old Testament as uh, anything that uh, you can find. And we're <clears throat> going to start our study of the prophecy of Isaiah with an introduction to the book. And by and large, I'm going to read the introduction that uh, John Martin, who is the author of this particular section of the book of Isaiah, uh, gives to the book of Isaiah with uh, some comments of my own. And I believe all of you have one of these uh, introductions. This comes straight from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And you can just follow right along with me. And feel free to ask any questions. And by the way, those of you who are in Webland, if you want a copy of this, we can provide it for you um, by, by means of uh, email. So just uh, send to our, uh, put your email, give it to uh, our webmaster, uh, Grady Baskin, Jr., and he's handling the uh, chat room tonight. We'll be happy to send you uh, this and all future uh, materials pertaining to the course. The book of Isaiah is one of the most loved books of the Bible. I think that's true. It is perhaps the best known of the prophetic books. I believe that's true. However, while it may be the most quoted of the books of the Old Testament, I sometimes think it is the least understood and read with a few exceptions. There are certain passages that stand out and that people know a little bit about. 
but very few uh, have devoted time to study what the real meaning and purpose and message of the book of Isaiah is all about. It contains several passages that are well known among Bible students. Uh, and uh, we won't take time to look at these now, but they include 1, 18, 7, 14, 9, 6, and 7. A lot of these are quoted in Handel's Messiah and are messianic passages and so forth. It has great literary merit and contains beautiful descriptive terminology. Uh, there's, there's no greater poetry in the scriptures, no greater poetry in the human language than is found in the book of Isaiah. It is a masterpiece of literary skill, poetry, narratives, history, prophecy, eschatology, uh, apocalyptic, you, you name it, visions. Nobody surpasses Isaiah in these genres and these uh, types of literature that exist. It really is a masterpiece, and it contains beautiful, descriptive terminology. Isaiah also contains much factual material about the society of Israel around 700 B.C. That's when Isaiah flourished, 700 B.C. Now, how long ago is that? That's some 2,700 years ago, and yet... His message is just as vital and powerful today as it was 2,700 years ago because it's the Word of God. Besides pointing out the shortcomings of the people, the prophet noted that God always has a remnant of believers through whom He works. Um, somebody has suggested that one of the main purposes of the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, was the responsibility of a prosecutor, a prosecutor. And uh, he had the unenviable responsibility of pointing out to Israel and to Judah, as the case may be, the shortfalls and the sins that they had committed against the law of Moses, against the law of God. And God sent his prophets as thundering prosecutors to uh, denounce the sins of Israel and to point them out and to indict the nation and the individuals within the nation for all of their shortcomings. But, that was the bad news. The good news was that there was redemption, that there was hope, that there was salvation by grace through faith. The message of salvation by grace through faith is just as strong in the prophets of the Old Testament as it is in the apostles of the New Testament. If we come away understanding that and learning that about Isaiah and these other prophets, we will have learned much. And God saves a remnant out of Israel. And there is a minority within Israel, including the prophets, who believe, who believe in the Lord, who believe in His Word, who are looking forward to the coming of the redemptive Messiah, and are part of the remnant according to the election of grace. Isaiah spoke more than any other prophet of the great kingdom into which Israel would enter at the second advent of the Messiah. What do we call that kingdom that Israel will enter into? The millennium. The millennium. 
much of the message of Isaiah is about the coming millennial kingdom of the Messiah. But you know, there's some professing Christians who say they don't believe in a millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. They call themselves amillennialists and uh, deny the future millennium. Well, what are they going to do with Isaiah? Who speaks over and over and over again about this coming kingdom and the blessings on the earth and in Israel when the Messiah comes and reigns upon the earth. Well, the amillennialists just have to ignore these passages or they reinterpret them to mean something beyond what are besides what the original readers, the Jewish people, the people of Israel read and understood. They interpret it, well, that means the church. Or that means heaven. Or it means something, but it doesn't mean, according to them, a reign of Christ upon the earth. Well, when they twist the scriptures in that way, they dishonor the word of God but that is not done here we endeavor to understand the word of God plainly if the plain say if the plain sense makes good sense seek no other sense that's a good dictum in the interpretation of the scriptures or anything else for that matter uh, Isaiah discussed the depths of Israel's sin and the heights of God's glory and his coming kingdom. The author and date. Who wrote this book and when did he write it? The author of this book was Isaiah, the son of Amos. The name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. In the Hebrew, Isaiah's name is pronounced Yeshua. Now, what does that sound a little bit like? Yeshua. Yeshua. Exactly. And it's essentially the same word. Referring to the salvation of the Lord. So, Yeshua and Yeshua are very definite kin, kinship words and refer to the Lord's salvation. Though more is known about Isaiah than most of the other writing prophets, the information on him is still scanty. Probably Isaiah resided in Jerusalem and had access to the royal court. He was not like Joel, who was uh, among the fig pickers. He was a, one of the elites in the city of Jerusalem probably of the nobility, and had access to the kings and to the priests, and was known uh, by the intelligentsia of the city of Jerusalem. Um, though... Um, According to tradition, he was a cousin of King Uzziah. But no firm evidence exists to support this. If he were, that would perhaps make him of the tribe of Judah. He did have personal contact with at least two of Judah's kings, who were David's descendants. And of course, he was a prophet in the time of the reigning kings of the son of David, of the house of David. Isaiah was married. He had two sons. Shear Jashub. Hey, there's a name for your next kid. Why don't you name your next child or grandchild Shear Jashub. That's a challenge. He'd love you for it. <laughs> Uh, and Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. <laughs> what a wonderful name for a kid. Well, those were the two kids 
uh, Isaiah, and they had meanings. Those two names had meanings, and we'll get into that when we get to the uh, text. Some have supposed from Isaiah's commissioning, chapter 6, that he was a priest. But no evidence in the book supports this. The reason they assert that from... Yes? Uh, I have a commentary that says they think he was because some of his visions uh, yeah. were given to him in the Holy of Holies. That's right. And chapter 6 positions him in the temple of the Lord and uh, sort of functioning like a priest. And that's why they uh, suppose that he was a priest. However, it doesn't actually say that in the text. Yes. I just wanted to be sure we got in here this this half. We've got a couple of old friends. We have Patty Taylor watching. She said hello. God bless everybody. Also an old uh, Tyndall friend, uh, Dr. Jim McGowan from Sugarland, and uh, is here. So. Uh, oh yes. Wanted. Very good. And they're both, uh, uh, and particularly Dr. McGowan is helping us with, we have apparently coming out a little bit hot in terms of our, our uh, audio, and he's been oh. very helpful in trying to get us correcting that. So Are we cooled down? Very cooled down. Yeah, all right. yeah. Well, he hadn't verified it yet, but we cool, we cool here and here. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, welcome, uh, Jim and Patty. Uh, we're delighted to have you in our midst uh, tonight out in Webland. Uh, okay. The year of Isaiah's death is unknown, but it was probably after Hezekiah's death in 686 B.C. And therefore probably in Manasseh's soul reign. They were co-regents for a period of 15 years or so, Manasseh and Hezekiah. But then Hezekiah, the good king, died, and that left Manasseh, the bad king, in control, complete control. And uh, that's when um, it is understood that Isaiah died. Um, be because Isaiah wrote a biography of King Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 32, 32. Did you know that Isaiah wrote a biography? Well, it's chronicled there in uh, the book of Chronicles that he did so. It's, it was not uh, inspired. And it does not survive. It's not part of the canon. Nevertheless, he wrote a biography. Uh, Isaiah's death would have occurred after Sennacherib's death. Who was Sennacherib? Assyria. Assyria, yes. King of Assyria, the one who ravaged uh, the northern kingdom and uh, Judah and threatened Jerusalem. But he died. And um, uh, so um, Isaiah's death would have occurred after Sennacherib's death, which was in 681 B.C. We have a date for that. Since the prophet's ministry began sometime in Uzziah's reign, you remember Uzziah? What was he famous for? Uzziah the king. Pardon? I thought you were talking about Uzziah. He reached out and touched the ark. Uh, uh, Tom. No? Uzziah. Uzziah the king. Tom. Yes. Tom, we have from uh, a couple of people in the chat room. I uh, request that you repeat the questions from the, uh, yes. from the audience. Yes. Or this, uh, the comment. Okay. Um, the suggestion was made that it was Uzza that we were referring to, but no. It's Uzziah the king. Anybody remember what he was famous for? He's the king that wanted to be a priest. He went into the temple. And what happened to him? Hmm? Didn't he become leprous? He, became, he was struck with leprosy. He walked out of there, he was white as a sheep. And he had leprosy. And... Uh, the Lord was not going to allow the confusion of the house of David with the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron. The king, kings were not to be confused with the priest. There was only one king. There would be only one king who would also be a priest. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king and priest and prophet as well. 
But Uzziah paid dearly for transgressing that uh, barrier between the, the being a king and being a Levitical priest. At any rate, he began his ministry uh, in the time of Uzziah's reign from 790 to 739 B.C. Isaiah ministered for at least 58 years. That's pretty long ministry for these prophets. 58 years from at least 739 when Uzziah died to 681 when Sennacherib died. According to tradition dating from the 2nd century A.D., Isaiah was martyred by King Manasseh. Justin Martyr, anybody know who Justin Martyr was? An early church father, yes. Uh, around uh, 100 to 165, you see, right, just in the 2nd century. Wrote that Isaiah was sawed asunder with a saw. How'd you like that? How do you do that? Is it like this or like this? Uh, e either way, it's bad. Huh? Maybe both. What? Maybe both. Both? All right. At any rate, it's a terrible way to be executed. And um, that gives you some idea about the evil character of Manasseh, the son of the good king Hezekiah. But he hated Isaiah and Isaiah's message from the Lord. And so he, at least the tradition is, that Manasseh had him killed. As is true of all other prophetic books in the Old Testament, except Lamentations, the book of Isaiah bears the name of its author. Many modern scholars divided the book into two or more parts and say that each part had a different author. However, according to strong Jewish and Christian tradition, the book had only one author. You go to a um, liberal seminary today and you take a course on Isaiah and I fear you will not study much about the content of the book of Isaiah. Instead, what you will be studying in is how many authors there were to the book of Isaiah and how you can tell that. And they will spend the whole semester speaking about first Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, and even Trito Isaiah. Uh, that's what they study. It's a shame. But according to the scriptures, there's only one Isaiah. How many of you have been in Jerusalem to the shrine of the book and have seen the scroll of the, the Dead Sea Scroll of the book of Isaiah? Uh, one, two, two, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if you've been to Jerusalem, been to the, the shrine of the book, you have seen the scroll of Isaiah stretch all the way around a great column. Yes. Wasn't the entire book of Isaiah found in the Dead Sea Scroll? That's that's what I'm describing here. Uh, this is the book of Isaiah that was that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was it's the only complete book of the Bible that they have found, and it's the whole book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters, including. Chapter 53. And, uh... Where is that now? Pardon? Where are those scrolls today? Well, this display is when what is called the shrine... Oh, where is where is this found today? Uh, this is in, in a museum called the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. And that's on the uh, campus of the University of Jerusalem and it is a beautiful structure. But at any rate, 
the main, the central feature is they have all these different displays of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the main thing is on the center column, which is about, oh, I'd say 25 feet in diameter, and is backlighted. And they have the scroll wrapped around this backlighted uh, pillar, 25 feet in diameter. And you can read, you can read the Hebrew of the book of Isaiah, yes. Is it the actual scroll itself or a replica? Well, for several years, that was the actual scroll. But it began to deteriorate. Now, exposed, in spite of the fact that it was very carefully um, monitored with temperature and lighting and everything else. But it began to deteriorate, and they said this is too valuable to allow it to deteriorate. So they made an identical copy, and the copy is what you see. But, it, you know, you, you couldn't tell it from the original. I certainly could. Yes? What material was it written on that uh, original? What material was it written on? It was written on uh, parchment, on hides of clean animals. Sheepskin, things of this nature. And uh, that's what the scrolls were written on. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I was looking for the next segment there, yeah. Do we know the approximate date of the writing of the original scroll? Or do they know? Yeah. Well, it was, uh, the question is, the writing of the, day of the original writing of the scroll, it would have been during the lifetime of Isaiah. And he lived, as we see here, from, um, uh, where is that, 739 to 681 B.C., like somewhere that. around 700 B.C. So, so actually I think he meant the, the scroll that's in the shrine, that's... Well, now when you say original, I, I think you, I, I thought you meant original. Now, which, what do you mean? Which, which scroll are you referring to? You talking about me? Yeah. I was wanting to know what, the one that we're, the one that we're seeing a copy of there in the museum. What? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, the Dead sea Scroll. When was that written? All right. The Dead Sea Scrolls were all written within about 100 years, from about 100 B.C., 100 B.C., until 70 A.D. See, in that, in that 170-year time period, all of them were, but they, they were copies, of course. And, uh, but uh, that's, that's when they were written, yeah. And they were preserved in these jars in the Dead Sea, and the climatic conditions enabled them to survive. Can you imagine something you write today on a piece of paper surviving for 2,000 years? Yes? While we're on the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you remember uh, what books they found besides Isaiah, or what other writings there were? What other books they found? Yeah, what were the other they found all the books of the Old Testament, parts of them, parts of all the books of the Old Testament except one book. One book was missing. They haven't found it yet. Any idea what that was? Esther. Esther has not been found. All the rest of the books, some, there's been some passage, some part of the book. Family. The Old Testament, is this, yeah. not set, is this the Septuagint? No. This no, the, the, well, most of them are in Hebrew. There are, there are some, there are things besides the Bible also. Uh, and, and some of them are in Hebrew, and some of them are in Aramaic, and some of them are in Greek. Yeah. Dead Sea Scrolls, very interesting subject. Yes. Okay, you said they were stored in jars. But how were the jars stored in the sea? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, they were, okay. How were the jars stored? 
uh, the, jar, the jars were earthen jars, and they had covers on them. They were stored in caves on the land beside the Dead Sea. Okay. They weren't actually put in the Dead Sea. That would have ruined them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing survives in the Dead Sea, including people. Uh, I've floated on the Dead Sea, but you don't dare open your eyes in the Dead Sea. It's, it's a scary thing. It's extremely salty. Okay. Uh, but you see, it's so dry in that locale that it, it preserved all of that material. And as soon as it's exposed to the air, it starts to deteriorate. Um, however, according to strong Jewish and Christian tradition, the book had only one author. No doubt was cast upon the Isaiah authorship until the 18th century. Nobody questioned that Isaiah was written by one author until the 18th century A.D. When critics began to attack a number of Old Testament books, and to question their authorship and internal unity. <coughs> Isaiah prophesied in the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, all kings of Judah. The reigns of these kings, including co-regencies, were Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and it gives the dates there, and uh, Hezekiah. And uh, then he refers to a chart that is in uh, this commentary that you can refer to. These years in Israel's history were a time of great struggle, both politically and spiritually. The northern kingdom of Israel was deteriorating politically, spiritually, and militarily, and finally fell to the Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C. You understand that Israel was a divided kingdom. There was the northern kingdom, there was the southern kingdom. What was the capital of the southern kingdom? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. They said y'all and everything in the southern kingdom. <laughs> then there was the northern kingdom. What was the capital of it? Samaria. Samaria, good. And uh, it was uh, they, they, it was at Antipathy. The north seceded from the south, in this case, and was antagonistic to the kingdom in Jerusalem, and uh, was much more pagan than the southern kingdom. And they worshipped idols much more, uh, although they did have some godly prophets from the Lord. Uh, and... Their demise occurred uh, over about a, over a hundred years before the demise of the southern kingdom. And the demise of the northern kingdom occurred in 722 when Assyria came down and swooped through the area and destroyed Samaria, the capital, and all of the northern kingdom of Israel. And carried away the captives into captivity. And what was the capital of Assyria? Damascus. Hmm? Damascus. What? Damascus. Damascus? Oh, that was the capital of Aram or Syria. But Assyria. Nineveh. 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 Who went to Nineveh? Jonah. 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 Right. After a little detour. Yes, a uh, long, long detour. Uh, wet and messy. But um, what modern town is at the town of Nineveh today? We read about it in the newspapers every day. We read about it today. Decree? No, not decree. Close. Mosul. Mosul. Mosul in Iraq is near the site of the ancient Nineveh. 
Mosul, M-O-S-U-L. Something like that. Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah looked as though it too would collapse and fall to Assyria, but it withstood the attack. In this political struggle and spiritual decline, Isaiah rose to deliver a message to the people in Judah. His message was that they should trust in the God who had promised them a glorious kingdom through Moses and David. Isaiah urged the nation not to rely on Egypt or any other foreign power to protect them, for the Lord was the only protection they would need. And they were sorely tempted when Assyria was invading to uh, make an alliance with somebody, including Egypt. And Egypt probably had the most powerful army uh, at the time to oppose Assyria. But Isaiah warned them, don't trust in Egypt. If you lean on Egypt, you're leaning on a broken reed. That's where that expression comes from. And what happens when you lean on a broken reed? It collapses. So they were to rely upon the Lord. And um, as long as they did, they were spared. I yes. want to be sure and get this in while tape, tape is rolling. Yes. This is a comment from my friend Dr. McGowan, Kendall, via Sugar Land now. Yes. And he just says, talking about the broadcast here in the, uh, uh, our Internet presentation, he says, this is a wonderful avenue for solid biblical teaching. I only wish more normative dispensational teachers were doing this. Dr. Jim McGowan. Well, thank you, Dr. Jim McGowan. We appreciate that. Uh, we call him Slim now. He's lost uh, about, I don't know how many pounds through the Atkins diet, and we're good friends. Uh, and he's a good student of the Word of God, and he, uh, he loves the study of the truth. And we appreciate your comments very much, uh, Jim, and uh, that's very kind. Uh, Hosea and Micah were Isaiah's contemporaries. Many have noted several parallels between the messages and vocabularies of Isaiah and Micah. They lived at the same time. And uh, both of them have the image of uh, beating uh, swords into plowshares. And uh, the image of the temple of the Lord on the great mountain of the Lord in the Messianic days. Well, our next subject is unity, and this is where it goes into a long discussion of how the book of Isaiah was written by one author. And if you were in a liberal seminary, you'd uh, study a lot about that or against that. Well, we're not going to uh, uh, go into that. You can study that at your leisure, and we'll go on to the pages after that to where it says purpose at the top when we come back from our break. So this is a good time to uh, go to our break. Now, uh, those of you who are in Webland, we uh, would suggest that you take a little break here too. We will take a break for 15 minutes. We'll come back at 10 minutes after the hour. And uh, you uh, catch your breath and uh, come back with us 10 minutes after the hour, and we'll continue in our study of the introduction to the prophet Isaiah. We continue, we continue in our, uh, the introduction to the prophecy of Isaiah, and we've skipped over the unity part, the part that proves, uh, shows the evidences for the single authorship of the book of Isaiah. You can read that at your leisure. I invite you to do so. It's very interesting. But uh, we will continue on with the material that has to do more with the subject matter of the prophecy of Isaiah. Yes? Is this material uploaded to the net so that web, web students can also access it? No, it's not on the web, as perhaps we could do it. Uh, we will certainly send uh, this <clears throat> to anybody who requests 
the email. Uh, there might be a copyright problem of posting it on the web, yeah. uh, since it's mostly material from another book. But I'm sure we can send this to our uh, students who request it, and uh, there'll be no problem that way. And then also, you can, uh, uh, if you have a bookstore anywhere near you, you can get uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary by Walford and Zook that has the commentary on the book of Isaiah. All right. Tom, uh, yes. before you start, I just want to say, uh, Dr. McGowan wrote back and said, yes, he lost 76 pounds. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that is a, congratulations yeah. there, Jim. Uh, that's a, a great accomplishment. And... Uh, what he has lost in weight, he has gained in uh, knowledge and in spiritual understanding of the Word of God. And we appreciate him as a friend and brother in the Lord. He is a graduate of Talbot, no, uh, excuse me, of uh, Tyndale Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, which is a sister school of the School of Tyrannus. And uh, if you want credit for your studies with us, you can obtain credit uh, in, uh, for this course in cooperation with uh, Tyndale Theological Seminary, and we hope you will do that. Um, please, uh, be, please correspond with me, communicate with me, and let me know that you want to do that, and we'll get you uh, on the right course for that. Yes. I bet Tyndale teaches one author. Yes, they do. Tyndale teaches one author for the Book of Isaiah. They do. And conservative seminaries do. It's the liberal seminaries that uh, make such an issue of more than one author. <clears throat> All right. Isaiah's primary purpose was to remind his readers of the special relationship they had with God as members of the nation Israel, his special covenant community. So you see, you have these, yes, uh, special covenant community, did it include Judah as well? Yes. Will you yes. repeat? Uh, the question was, uh, when he says uh, members of the nation of Israel, his special covenant community, is he including Judah as well? Yes. Often when uh, theologians speak of the nation of Israel, they're looking at the entirety of the 12 tribes, not so much as the breakdown into the sub-kingdoms uh, of Israel and Judah. But that's right, especially when you're dealing with Isaiah, you need to make clear what he's speaking about. Is it the whole 12 tribes or just the northern tribes? Isaiah was addressing the whole 12 tribes in, in the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> he was addressing Judah in particular uh, and Jerusalem. Sometimes his message would extend out to the, the whole 12 tribes, but by and large, the 10 tribes had been conquered, defeated, and carried off into uh, Assyria. So uh, he couldn't address them directly anymore. Like the other writing prophets, Isaiah knew of the Abrahamic covenant in which God had promised that Israel would enjoy a special relationship with him possess the land of Canaan, and be a blessing to others. Now we talk about there being the prophecies of the future Messianic kingdom, what we call the millennial kingdom of Christ. Uh, where is the church in Isaiah? What does it, Isaiah say about the church? Nothing. Nothing! You mean as brilliant and as all-inclusive a prophet as Isaiah doesn't mention a word about the church? No. That's right. No. There was no revelation about the church at that point. Not in the whole Old Testament. It was a mystery. Pardon? It was a mystery. It was a mystery hidden in the plan of God. God knew about the church. God knew there was going to be a church. God knew there was going to be a church age, but he did not reveal it to his Old Testament prophets. So what, the, what they knew of eschatology of the last days was that there would be a time of trial, the tribulation, and then there would be the blessings of the millennium, 
the messianic kingdom of God upon the earth with the Messiah sitting upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. Well, what does Isaiah say about the rapture of the church? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. That's right, because there was no... Yes? There's a hint about the rapture. Where? Where? Verse 61, or he says, Come on, my people, and I hide you until the indignation is past. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that, it, you may make an application uh, that way, but what was the interpretation? No, that, it, was, it was beheading there. I understand. Well, but it's, but it's probably speaking of the. the care of the remnant during the tribulation and the protection of the remnant during the tribulation time that's a real interesting passage pardon that's a real interesting passage yes. because it's very rapture language we'll get that where did you say it was i thought it was 61 yeah we'll get to it in about uh seven or ten weeks here yeah <laughs> yeah right uh, but there's nothing about the rapture here because there's no revelation about the church because the, church, the rapture has to do with the church and the taking up of the church at the end of the church age. But there's nothing about that because God did not reveal any of that until Christ had come, had died, had risen from the dead, and ascended into heaven. Then he began to reveal what the conditions would be between the first and second comings which would include the church age and the diaspora of the covenant nation Israel, which is coming to a close. All right. Isaiah was also aware of the Mosaic covenant given Israel at the time of the exodus from Egypt and repeated by Moses to the generation of Israelites who were about to enter Palestine or the land of Canaan, or the land of Israel. Throughout the book of Deuteronomy, God through Moses had promised the people that as members of the covenant community, they would be blessed by him if they lived according to the Mosaic covenant. But he also warned them that if they did not obey his commandments and decrees, they would experience the curses, punishments, spelled out in the covenant. <clears throat> including exile from the land, uh, which was impending. And it already happened to the northern kingdom, Israel, as they had gone off into Assyria. This was happening as Isaiah lived. He saw us. He was a witness to the attack upon and um, destruction of the northern kingdom and their being carried away into captivity. Oh. Yes. We have, we have a comment here uh, from Dr. McGowan. Uh, only one interpretation, perhaps perhaps many applications. Yes. No church, no rapture. In that's the right. Testament. That's, that's the dictum that we have. There's one interpretation, many applications. Um, and that, that is the whole concept of, um, of hermeneutics. Some people, uh, you know, they... Uh, thumb through the Bible and stick their finger in it and say uh, whatever it says there I'm going to do and uh, they flip over and they're going through uh, Joshua and it says go and kill Canaanites so what do you do do you go and kill Canaanites there aren't any Canaanites how do you do this no you have to interpret everything according to the time and the place and the people to whom it was given the dispensation in which it was given, and the circumstances in which it's given. But having done that interpretation, you can apply this. Who do we fight against flesh and blood? Principalities and power. Against principalities and power, against its spiritual forces. And so what Joshua says and what the Lord says to Joshua about going and hiding the uh, Canaanites can be applied to our warfare, not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces that we confront today. Well, that's a good point.
So uh, there's one interpretation, many applications. If you learn that truth uh, of interpretation uh, here, you will have uh, really accomplished something that will stand you in good stead in your reading of the Word. Um, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, uh, well, let's see, we read that. However, because uh, of the Abrahamic covenant in which God promised blessing on Israel and the world, Moses could confidently affirm that even after the people had been exiled from the land, the Lord would someday bring them back to the land of promise and establish them in his kingdom. Yes, things were going to be difficult. Uh, the northern kingdom had already been cap taken captive. The southern kingdom was going to be taken captive. Not by Assyria, but by whom? Babylon. Babylon was going to come also from Mesopotamia, a different part of it, and carry Judah and Jerusalem into captivity. Uh, but, in spite of all that, judgment, God was going to bless Israel with his grace and bring them back to the land of promise and establish them in his kingdom. Um, and we see the precursor of that today. That's what's happening today in the land of Israel. They're coming back to the land in unbelief and in preparation for the second coming of Christ when Israel will receive the Lord as they did not receive him as a nation at his first coming. We're living in great days. This is a tremendous time to live. Uh, and if those things are close, then the rapture of the church, which must occur before the tribulation, must be near indeed. And uh, is imminent. He could come at any moment. You like that idea? Are you ready for the rapture? If you have received the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you are ready for the rapture. Yes. Whether you know it or not. <laughs> Notice in the, uh, the third paragraph on this sheet, headed up with the first purpose, he mentioned that land over there is Palestine. <coughs> yes. He said that people were about to enter the land of Palestine. Yes. Well, are you are you concerned about the use of the term Palestine? Yeah, yeah. Just, a yeah. huh? Just a little bit. Yes, I am too. Uh, and you find that creeping up into even good uh, Christian interpreters, uh, the use of the term Palestine. That's a non-biblical term. It's a common term now, but it's a biblical term is the land of Canaan or the promised land or the land of Israel. Yes. Uh, Dr. McGowan has another observation. He says, Isaiah talks of a remnant, but that remnant is not the church. Yeah. It's the Jewish remnant of the end of times. Yeah. No need to interpret. That's right. Uh, and and it, there was a remnant in existence at the time of Isaiah. There was a remnant in existence at the <laughs> time of uh, uh, the prophet uh, Elijah. Elijah. Thank you. Oh, boy, if I can't remember something, I, my class can do it. The prophet Elijah. Uh, had, there was a remnant according to the election of grace then. There was a remnant of Israel at the time of the apostle Paul. And there will be a remnant at the time of the return of Christ to the earth. And that will, it will be a very large remnant then. Uh, a third of the nation will be believers and they will receive Christ and enter into the kingdom. All right. So Isaiah was calling the people of Judah back to a proper covenantal relationship with God. He was reminding his generation of the sinful condition into which they were living and of its consequences. God would judge the nation, but he would also eventually restore them to the land <coughs> with Full kingdom blessings because of his promises to Abraham. Now, his 
punishment of the nation was according to what uh, principle? Obedience. Obedience to what? The law. The law. Or disobedience. Or disobedience. Yes. His restoration of the nation back to the land and to blessings would be according to the principle of what? Grace. Grace. Would they be restored because they kept the law? No. no. It would be because they believed. It would be because of God's grace through faith. And uh, God's grace is operating with his covenant nation Israel through the promises to Abraham. Isaiah was aware that Judah was destined for exile as had recently befallen the northern kingdom. Judah was going to have the same fate. His book then was directed to two groups of people. Those of his generation who had strayed from the covenantal obligations given them in the Mosaic Law, and B, to those of a future generation who would be in exile. That is, in the Babylonian exile. Isaiah was calling the first group, group back to holiness and obedience, and he was comforting the second group with the assurance that God would restore the nation to their land and would establish his kingdom of peace and prosperity. The theme of comfort is dominant in Isaiah 40 to 66. And it begins with comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Um, and he gives a lot of references here in, in that section of Isaiah where the term comfort is used. Thirteen times comfort is used in this section with only one occurrence of comforted in chapters 1 through 39. <coughs> Themes and theology of Isaiah. Some difficulty exists in determining a central theme for Isaiah around which all the other material in the book revolves. And that's because he weaves in and out of these great major themes that we found in the, in the Minor Prophets. Those same themes run through Isaiah. Judgment for the breaking of the law, promises, the remnant, uh, yes, that's not at all amazing for a ministry that lasted 58 years plus. Uh, uh, so there would be more than one thing. Yes, yeah, 58 years of ministry. And, and but this was true even of the uh, the minor prophets who had had even a short time. They would weave between these different themes. But what was the central thing? Some have suggested that the book has two themes, one for chapters 1 through 39 and another for chapters 40 through 66. Judgment seems to be the emphasis in the first part, and salvation and comfort are prominent in the second. Since Isaiah followed the theology of Deuteronomy, punishment must come for failure to live according to the Mosaic Covenant before a time of blessing can come. The two parts of Isaiah can be reconciled. Chapters 1 through 39 point out the nation's problem of sin, which must be rectified before a proper relationship with the covenant God can be restored. Judgment, emphasized in 1 through 39, is the purifying force that leads to the forgiveness and pardoning of sins, emphasized in chapters 40 through 66. Ultimately, redemption for Israel must come from the ideal servant, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah who will accomplish what the servant nation cannot do. There's, this, there's the portrait of the servant nation and the servant Messiah in those latter passages. The accounts for the so-called servant songs in the second major division of Isaiah uh, is where all of this is uh, dis described and prophesied. <clears throat> we'll, we'll read a lot about the servant of the Lord referring to the nation in some cases and then referring specifically to the Messiah himself in other passages.
<clears throat> but chapters 40 to 66 emphasize more than redemption from sin. Those chapters go beyond that to speak of a change in the cosmos, of the Lord's restoration of his created order. Chapters 1 to 39, judgment on sin is stressed. In chapters 40 through 66, atonement for that sin and the resulting change in people and the world system are discussed and prophesied. Judgment, then, must come before blessing can follow. So he sees that as the unifying theme of the entire book of Isaiah. Isaiah had a lofty view of God. The Lord is seen as the initiator of events in history. It's not Assyria or Shalmaneser or Tiglath Policer, or any of those worldwide ruder, rulers, or Nebuchadnezzar, who are the initiators of the events of human history. God is the initiator. He is apart from and greater than his creation. That's a great thought in theology. God is not a part of his creation. He is not a created being. He is the creator. So he is above creation. He is apart from creation and is greater than creation. Yet, he is involved in the affairs of that creation. He's deeply involved. He is moving in and about all of the events of creation. This is the sovereignty of God that's involved here. In the ancient Near East, names were more meaningful than they are today. A person's name was an indication of his or her character. How would you like to have a name that reflected your character? What would that name be? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the book of Isaiah is no exception. <clears throat> For in this book, the meanings of God's names play an important role in several prophetic utterances. Isaiah uses the name the Lord, which in Hebrew is Yahweh, by itself more than 300 times making it by far the most prominent name for deity Isaiah used. That is, not Elohim so much, not El, but uh, Yahweh, the personal name of God. Since this name is the uh, covenant name for God, it is natural that Isaiah used it often. He also frequently used the name Elohim in both parts of the book, but not as much as Yahweh. It is noteworthy that God occurs six times in chapter 40, and sometimes translates the shorter form El, which introduces the section on comfort for the covenant people. As the one supreme deity, God can give comfort to his people. El seems to be used as a polemic against the other gods. For a number of its occurrences appear in the section in which the Lord was speaking of his sovereignty over false gods. Were there false gods? Yeah. And uh, the world worships false gods all over the place. Four times God affirmed, I am God, and twice he affirms, I am the Lord. Adonai, or the shortened form of Adon. Now, when you see uh, in the scriptures the word Lord 
in all caps, that's a, that's a sign that it's the translation of the word Yahweh, the four, the four letters. Uh, when you see it like this with a capital L and lowercase o-r-d, that's an indication that it's a translation of Adonai, which means master. And is not the personal name of God, but is a title, the master. Suggests, Adonai suggests God's dominance over his creation and is used numerous times in Isaiah. Many of them in chapters 1 through 39. The Lord Almighty, Yahweh Shabbat, the Lord of hosts, the most common compound name for God in the book of Isaiah, appears 46 times in chapters 1 through 39 and six times in the remainder of the book. This compound title links the covenant name of God, Yahweh, with his sovereignty over all heavenly powers. God is also called the Lord, the Lord Almighty, Adonai Yahweh Shabbat. Ten times. He is referred to as the God of Israel, twelve times, and the Holy One of Israel, twenty-five times. Redeemer is used of God thirteen times, all in chapters 41 to 63. Think of that. Redeemer is the name he, that he is called in that very pivotal section of Isaiah, which stresses God's redeeming work for Israel. And only one other time in the rest of the Old Testament. Certainly Isaiah centered his theology and his book on God and the work that he was doing and would continue to do in the world. All right. That's the introduction. Any uh, question before we go back? I wasn't sure how long that would take us. And we'll delve a little bit into that unity question since we have a little time remaining. Any questions on what we've presented thus far in uh, the introduction to Isaiah? Everybody satisfied? All right. Um, yes. He didn't have the, anything uh, in the way of a vision of a church, but yet he did mention the Messiah, yeah. didn't he? Didn't yes. He? The question is, uh, he didn't mention the church, Isaiah didn't, but he did mention the Messiah. And not only one coming of the Messiah, but two comings of the Messiah. So, which led him to believe that, you know, nothing, I mean, the Messiah would be coming to Israel. Yes. That, that he would come to Israel, yes. Because there was no church at the time. That's right. Although, uh, part of uh, what the Isaiah prophesies, like the other prophets, is that not only Israel would be blessed with the coming of Messiah, but also the Gentiles. But the concept that there would be one body uh of Jews and Gentiles made one in the Messiah testifying to the world that was never revealed to Isaiah or any of the prophets that is about the church age or about the church that was a mystery that was hidden so, so that really emphasizes the uh, God's uh, treatment of the nation of Israel and the church is kind of a seems like a little afterthought in the middle there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> sometimes sometimes we dispensationalists are criticized for making the church a parenthesis, or like you say, a, an afterthought in the plan of God. Now, God knew about the church age, and it was a major thing that he had, but he hid it. He didn't reveal it until the first coming of the Messiah. Then he splashed it all over the pages of the New Testament as a glorious part of his plan. 
but it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. That's true. Uh, yes, now, Mark? It may not have been revealed in the Old Testament, but you have to admit that it was hinted at because of the typology and the fact that in Isaiah, <laughs> he mentions the Gentiles over and over, yeah. how they would come. But when he's... No, uh, the, can, you, can, you, can you rephrase his comments? Yes. Uh, the question was, since Isaiah prophesies about the blessings of the Gentiles, then uh, is, does this mean that Isaiah was hinting at uh, the revelation about the church uh, in, in the future dispensation? I would suggest that what he was talking about, his interpretation, the interpretation of what he was saying, had to do with the blessing of the Gentiles in the kingdom age, in the messianic age, when Christ established his kingdom upon the earth. Now, uh, by application we see that there's blessing of the Gentiles now in our time. But that's not what Isaiah was speaking about then. Well, what about the typology? I think there's typology with you know, Eliezer and in Genesis 23 and 24 and 25 and, and Isaac as a type of Christ. There, there is some hinting at the interpretation. You know? All right. The, uh, now, we, we've studied uh, maybe a four-year time uh, typology oh, here. Right. You remember? Uh, and we have a very strict <coughs> definition of typology. And that is that it is a passage, it is an illustration that is authorized, an authorized illustration by the scriptures. Uh, for instance, we, we, know, <clears throat> we know that Isaac is a type of Christ in, in being offered as a sacrifice because not because we think it's a good illustration, but because the writer of Hebrews and other passages say that Isaac is a type of Christ. And not only his, his sacrifice, but his resurrection. Therefore, that's an authorized type. Now, Eliezer going to find a bride for Isaac is a wonderful illustration uh, to us of... Uh, the Holy Spirit going to find a bride for the Lord's Son. Uh, and, and we teach that as a beautiful illustration. Nevertheless, nowhere in, the, nowhere in the scriptures is there any comment about that. Well, but it, it's not, it's not uh, declared to be an illustration. Like Isaac is declared to be an illustration of, uh, of Christ. So we can apply it. We can say, yes, that's a beautiful illustration, but it doesn't fit the uh, doesn't fit the um, requirement of a type. And <clears throat> there is one place, though, that there is a type of the church in the Old Testament. Is that the uh, children of Israel being led through? And baptized unto Moses. <clears throat> well, that might be an, uh, <coughs> a type of the individual believer, I think, in a sense, uh, more than the church. <clears throat> but that's a possibility. There's another. There's another one. Another type. No, no. Give up. Eve. Paul says in Ephesians that uh, Adam uh, and Eve were a type of Christ and the church. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, but that doesn't make it a prophecy. And Moses knew nothing about the church. There was no prophecy, stated prophecy, about the church. It was only after the church was created that the Apostle Paul looked back and said, yes, now here is an illustration 
of the church, Adam and Eve. At any rate, okay, well, let's see now. Did you have a, a question? I was just thinking and comment in connection with something Roby said about Isaiah's talking about the Messiah coming to Israel. But uh, didn't technically both times he came to Israel? Yes. I mean, um, the first time he came to Israel, and when he comes back again, he will be coming. Back the question to is, Israel. didn't doesn't Christ come or doesn't Christ come both times with reference to Israel? Yes. He said it himself in his first coming, I came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And on a couple of rare occasions, he spoke to a Gentile. Aren't you glad he did? But that was rare. Yes. Uh, comment from uh, Dr. McGowan. Okay, we're getting some good material from Dr. McGowan. There is no hint or clue about the church in the Old Testament. Consider, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to, to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, past <clears throat> Ephesians 3.9, and to bring to light what is the administration of the ministry which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. That's from Dr. Jim. And yeah, that's from Ephesians. Ephesians, yes. Sir. Yes, and that's what we studied two semesters ago was the book of Ephesians. That's absolutely right. And uh, it was hidden. It was not revealed. And uh, it wasn't until the first coming of Christ that we had the revelation about the church. Absolutely true. And this was the great discovery of the dispensationalists. Yes. Well, I say you can't hide something that isn't that doesn't exist. <laughs> you can't hide something that doesn't exist. Well, you can hide you can hide the revelation about it. Yes, and that's what the Lord did. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure we got to your question, did we? No, no, uh, Bob. Yeah, I was talking about. In each case, the first coming and second. Oh, oh yeah. and then the second coming, and in the second coming, he comes to redeem Israel. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him. So uh, all Israel shall be saved. Yeah, Walter? Well, the book of Enoch, who saved out of the flood, and Noah and his family, who were saved through the flood, and the rest of the people were destroyed by the flood. So I see Enoch had been uh, raptured out of the church. Am I wrong with that? It's, it's an illustration. But it's not a type, because nowhere in the nowhere in the scriptures is Enoch said to be an illustration of the rapture. We may we may think it is a good illustration. My big operation. Uh, Wonderful operation. Yes, that's right. And I have no problem with applying, making an application like that and an illustration like that, well, as long as we understand that there's nothing revealed in the Old Testament. Directly about the church. My, my point, I guess, was that Isaiah, when looking at this, must have known that somebody was going to be saved out of the tribulation and not and, and go and not be involved in the tribulation, which hopefully that's us, yeah. the church. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Dr. McGowan, I believe, responding to Mark. Okay. Uh, Getting a yeah, response uh, right. from. Uh, Dr. Jim. I, I believe he's, uh, he says, the brother does not understand the biblical meaning of a mystery. A ministry is something hidden and which must be divinely revealed. Otherwise, it will remain hidden. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Come on, disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's uh, let's look here at this unity issue here for the time remaining. We don't have too much time, do we? How much time have we got? We got five minutes. Five minutes. All right, let's just delve into it a little bit. Many scholars question the unity of the book, holding that it was originally two books, with chapters 40 to 66, written by somebody they call Deutero Isaiah. Who's Deutero Isaiah? Well, that means second Isaiah. They don't know who it is, but they... Imagine this guy, who supposedly lived during or after the Babylonian captivity. That's a hundred years later, after Isaiah, the first, what they would consider the first Isaiah, or even 
three chapters 1 to 39, 40 to 55, and 56 to 66. With the last division written by who other than Trito, Isaiah. Who's that? Well, the third Isaiah. Many conservative scholars have answered liberal scholars' arguments against the unity of the book. The evidence for its unity is both external, evidence outside the Bible, and in other books of the Bible, and internal evidence within the book itself. You get that? There's external evidence for the unity of the book, and there is internal unity evidence within the book itself that it was written by one author. External evidence. As already stated, Jewish tradition has uniformly ascribed the entire book to Isaiah. You know, all the rabbis, they never split in into a two, three Isaiah. They always referred to you as the one Isaiah. That's, that's going back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of interpretation by the, by the rabbinical scholars. The Dead Sea Scrolls includes a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, <clears throat> have the complete book of Isaiah, thus pointing to its acceptance as one book by the Qumran community in the 2nd century B.C. Uh, you were asking about when the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were written. You're going back to the 2nd century B.C. up to 70 A.D. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament in the 2nd century, that was the first translation of any book, by the way, was the Old Testament translated from Hebrew into Greek. Gives no indication that the book of Isaiah was anything other than the single book. Christian tradition has uniformly assumed that Isaiah was a single work until the 18th century when liberals began to challenge that position. The New Testament writers assumed that Isaiah was the author of the entire book. In the New Testament, all the major sections of Isaiah are quoted under the title of Isaiah. They don't say 2nd Isaiah, 3rd Isaiah, or anything like that. They all just say Isaiah. For example, John 12, 38 describes Isaiah 53, 1 to Isaiah. And John 12, 39 uh, ascribes Isaiah 6.10 to Isaiah. Several portions of Isaiah 40 to 66, which are quoted in the New Testament. Drop down to the next paragraph. Jesus Christ assumed that Isaiah was the author of the whole book. Jesus was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which he unrolled and from which he read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. What better testimony to the unity of the book of Isaiah than the ministry of Christ himself.